All right, so welcome back everyone to the Physics and Astronomy Department Colloquium. And I'm very excited this week that we have visiting us uh, Dr. Regina Caputo from NASA Goddard. Uh, so Regina got her PhD in 2011 from Stony Brook and cut her teeth actually working with the Atlas experiment at CERN where she did her first postdoc at the Universität Mainz. Uh, after that, so she actually switched over to doing a little bit more astroparticle. And so her second postdoc at the University of Santa Cruz, uh, she started working with the Fermi LAT space telescope. Uh, so she retains an interest, a strong interest in particle physics. These days, it's mostly dark matter detection, uh, but now looking um, using gamma rays indirectly and other multi wavelength and multi messenger approaches, um, surveying various energetic objects in space. All right. Thanks, Regina, for joining us. Sure. Thank you for the introduction, Betsy. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, virtually and hopefully one day actually in person. Um, and so as uh, today I'm going to be talking with you about uh, some of the most energetic objects in the universe and the dawn of this new era called multi messenger astrophysics and how everything is connected together. And so um, I'll go ahead and start by kind of taking a step back. And so this picture might look familiar. Uh, this is actually our galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, but it's shown in, in optical light. And so, you know, if somehow you had really good eye sensitivity and had a very good vantage point, this is what the Milky Way looks like, you know, with your eyes that you could see it. Um, but this isn't the full picture of how we understand the Milky Way and how we understand what's going on. Uh, what we really need are lots of different wavelengths in order to really understand the different composition uh, what's happening where different objects, different sources emit in different band passes. And you can see starting all the way from radio emission, all the way at the top, all the way down to the gamma rays. Uh, to get a full picture of everything that's happening, you really need all this information because uh, just optical light is not sufficient to really see what's happening in, in our galaxy, much less the rest of the universe. And so this is, you know, one way of thinking of this as the parable to really understand something uh, you need to uh, look at it from many different vantage points. And this is really the approach of looking at multi wavelength light and looking at the, ele the full electromagnetic spectrum. If you want to really understand things, you need to observe it in multiple wavelengths, because that is what gets you the, the full picture. And so we developed this whole electromagnetic spectrum. And in order to use and observe all of these different spectrum, you need lots of different tools because some light uh, penetrates the Earth's atmosphere and we can observe it from the ground. Uh, some of it does not. And so we need telescopes in space. Uh, it covers you know, several you know, tens of orders of magnitude. You know? And so we're talking about things at very high frequencies to very low frequencies from light the size that has waves the size of buildings all the way to an atomic nucleus. And so you need lots of different approaches. And what most people think of astronomy is, is what is produced thermally. So produces normally in normal stellar processes. Uh, this is like, you know, like I said, stuff that happens in stars, the cosmic microwave background. And so this covers, you know, mostly from microwave, uh, you know, through ultraviolet. And so that's typically what you think of. But what I'm going to talk to you today is about gamma rays. And this is the highest energy form of light. And even though um, it is a small bubble, these are not representative of actually how much uh, energy they cover. Gamma rays are everything higher than X-rays. And in order to get gamma rays, it's because it's not produced in typical stellar processes, uh, what you need is some energy source, some kind of acceleration mechanism. Then you need a production mechanism. And then you subtract away any kind of absorption and propagation. And that's what gives you the gamma ray sky. And, and that is what you know, is kind of the difference between when you're looking at these photons at these really, really high energies. And, you know, you can break this down as to an extreme event that happens um, with an extreme field, an extreme magnetic field. 
Uh, and this produces things like cosmic rays. And then there's also targets like the you know, interstellar medium or cosmic microwave background. And then anything that you need to subtract away is this foreground gas and dust. And so that's, that is what gets you uh, the gamma ray sky. And so we have a telescope, uh, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope that was launched uh, 13 years, about 13 years ago. <clears throat> And on board, it has two instruments, which are designed to observe gamma rays. The large area telescope is uh, the big silver box on top of the spacecraft. Um, and it has a very large field of view. It observes 20% of the sky at any given time. And it observes the full sky every three hours. Um, it's important to note that this is not a telescope that you point at something. Uh, gamma rays are too high of energy to focus. And so basically whatever comes into the detector is what you get. And it observes in a range from about 20 or so MeV to well over 300 GeV. We've seen photons that are well into the TeV, so many decades in energy. The second instrument is called the Gamma Ray Burst Monitor. And it is these little um, cylinders that are located all around the base of the spacecraft. And it has two different subsystems. The first one is a sodium iodide subsystem. And this observes lower energy gamma rays. So when you see the 8 keV, that's what the sodium iodide does. And then it has these BGO detectors, which are just, it's just another scintillator. And that goes up to the higher energies. And so that's how we really are able to cover from a few keV to you know, a TEV uh, with this one telescope. So many, many decades in, in energy across the electromagnetic spectrum. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about how these detected, the, these detectors work. So as I mentioned, uh, we have these, um, because the, and the reason is because these are a bit different than normal telescopes, like what you'd think of as, as a typical telescope. And so, as I mentioned, we have these low energy sodium iodide detectors and those, those little cylindrical um, things that are looking in all different directions. That's how we see the full unocculted sky. Um, and then you have these high energy uh, BGO detectors, which is just a different, different kind of detector material. And the way that it observes an event is it does not do any background subtraction. So it sees a constant level of background. And then say when a gamma ray burst happens, you'll see a spike in the events. And this is an example of something you would see, say, from three different detectors. And what it does is it takes that signal and co-adds them together to get a signal. And you get a spike in the event uh, rate. And so that's how the, this kind of a scintillation detector works. There's also the, the large area telescope, which for those of you who are more familiar with particle physics, this will seem very familiar, um, which is, I guess, how I kind of got wrapped into this uh, kind of astrophysics. Um, but the way that it works is it, it causes the gamma rays to convert into electron-positron pairs. And these electron-positron pairs are what we use to reconstruct the direction uh, on the sky. And so that's how we get our, our, where these particular events came from. And then below that, the tracker subsystem, we have a calorimeter, which does the energy measurement. So this is how we get location and energy on the sky from a particular uh, event. And we do photon counting. So we see individual events. There's no large bidding from this, this kind of detector. Um, to veto against charged particles, uh, we have an anti-coincidence detector, and that's exactly as it sounds. Um, if an event hits in the same time and place as a, a gamma ray readout, then we say, okay, that was a cosmic ray. And we do keep some of those events, but we're mostly interested in gamma rays. And we read out at about two kilohertz, and we get enough uh, selected data at about 400 hertz. So that's about how many events we see. And just to show you what an event looks like in this uh, telescope, uh, the green arrow is a simulated 27 GeV gamma ray event. And you'll see it interact at some point in the tracker and then deposit its energy in the calorimeter. And you'll see the lack of hits in the anti-coincidence detector. And so what we do is we reconstruct those events and make that data publicly available um, within about 24 hours, although most of the time it's less than that. And so when something exciting goes off in the sky, anybody 
can take a look at this data at any point. Um, also, there's like lots and lots of sources, but I'll be getting into that in a second. And so overall, this is what the gamma ray sky looks like to the, to the Fermi Large Area Telescope. And this is in galactic coordinates. So if you're looking straight down the center, that is the center of the Milky Way. And you'll see that the Milky Way makes lots of gamma rays. It's very bright. And that's mostly because there's lots of uh, dust and stuff to scatter off of. So lots of cosmic rays scattering off of dust that make the Milky Way very bright in gamma rays. Um, but there's lots and lots of sources. It's not just the Milky Way that's bright. Um, there's lots of sources outside of the galaxy, things like active galactic nuclei, globular clusters, starburst galaxies. We can see lots of these. These are all these little dots outside of the galactic plane. Um, within the galaxy, we also see lots of sources like pulsars, which are rapidly rotating neutron stars with very high magnetic fields. We also see supernova remnants and pulsar wind nebulae, lots of those. Um, we also see lots of local sources. So solar flares, for example, um, we see that, we see solar flares, and also terrestrial gamma ray flashes, which are correlated with lightning. So we also see big bursts of particles from those. And all in all, in the, this is the 10-year sky map, so it's a couple of years old, but we see over 5,000 sources. And that's about as many sources as you can see with your naked eye on a clear night, um, or how you would if you could see the full sky. Um, but what this map doesn't show you is any exotic or transient astrophysics. And so transient, I mean things like, you know, gamma ray bursts that, you know, are a burst of photons and then they turn off. And exotic is, as Betsy mentioned, are things like dark matter. <laughs> and so I've, I've kind of laid the stage as to what exactly, you know, gamma ray, what gamma rays are, where they come from. And now what I'd like to get into is multi-messenger astrophysics. And so the world fundamentally changed in 2017 because for the first time we were able to observe, Ooh, hello, is there a question? No, I think you're good. Okay, cool. So for the first time, we were able to not only observe uh, sources or events in light, but we were able to observe them with a gravitational wave. And this unlocked a whole new kind of astrophysics. And so what I'm showing you now are two neutron stars that are orbiting each other. And as their orbit decays, they emit gravitational waves that are detectable by Li the LIGO and Virgo observatories. And so what you've seen is as this in spiral happens, you see that gravitational wave strain map that you see in the lower left. Now, as they in spiral and merge together, a, an explosion happens. And so the gravitational radiation stops. And as the merge happens, it launches a short gamma ray burst. And these, when they occur, are the most energetic uh, events in the universe. Something like 10 to the 53 ergs per second or something like that. And so this short gamma ray bursts blast this jet of gamma rays, and you could see that in magenta, and it's along the polar axis. And if this happens to be aligned with Earth, we will be able to see it with detectors like the Fermi gamma ray burst monitor. And so that was that, the, that instrument that I showed you. And so, what happened was about 1.7 seconds after the gravitational wave uh, event happened, we detected a short gamma ray burst. And you could see the black line is when the, uh, on the right or on the left is when this merger happened. And then that spike is when we saw the gamma ray burst. And so uh, this happened on August 17th, 2017. And this is a way that we've made it to sound.
And so a lot of people have um, likened being able to observe the universe in gravitational waves as a way of using a different sense. And so that's the auditory portion. So you're adding a different sense, a new sense in order to experience the universe. And beyond, and what this did was this launched every telescope on earth when this happened, started looking for the source of this to try to follow up and understand more about this event that happened. And so, uh, what we were able to find was that um, after this merger happened, uh, rapid process nucleosynthesis happened, and this is the first confirmed kilonova that was observed. And the kilonova emitted across the electromagnetic spectrum from UV to optical to infrared, uh, hours to weeks, and even longer time scales in the radio. This was months after this event happened. And what you can see on the left is the brightness as a function of wavelength. And as you go down as a function of time since the merger. And then the same is shown on the right in apparent magnitude versus day in different wavelength bands. And so <clears throat> what this did was it told us details about the merger, the ejecta, the composition. And so it's a very exciting time because um, we learned a lot about how elements are formed. Because this was done using this rapid, rapid process nucleosynthesis, uh, fundamentally how the elemental origins uh, occur changed on that day, on those days, once we understood exactly what happened. And so you see all of those elements in yellow, that's coming from merging neutron stars. So if you saw this image of elemental origins, from you know, five or six years ago, it would fundamentally look different because we didn't know where these heavy elements come from, came from. And it was an outstanding question because it didn't seem like supernovae were producing them. And so, you know, I always like to point out, you know, why did why is why is somebody interested in this or why, you know, does my, you know, my mom care about this? And it's, you know, everybody has things like gold jewelry or platinum, maybe not platinum jewelry, but gold jewelry. And like this is where gold is made. The majority of gold is made in the universe is from this process. But we not only learned cool things about where the elements form, we also were able to put uh, constraints on fundamental parameters uh, of the universe, things like the Hubble constant. We were able to measure it in a completely new way. Um, we also were able to measure the speed of gravity because you looked at the difference in time between uh, when the gravitational wave stopped and when the electromagnetic uh, signal was detected. And you could see that gravity and light interact in the universe in the same way. And so this actually was also a test of the equivalence principle of gravity. And it ruled out many theories of modified gravity to explain dark matter. So it, it was really a huge uh, uh, discovery. And so this is another way that we're able to experience the universe and understand fundamentally more about it. And so this brings me to the next part. So this was the cosmic explosion part of the talk. And now I'll talk a little bit about cosmic accelerators, because one of the main outstanding questions, uh, the plot that you're looking at on the left, is the cosmic ray spectrum. And you'll see this also is crossing some more than 10 orders of magnitude. And cosmic rays, for the purposes of this, are made up mostly of protons. And you can see that you know, there are different features in the spectrum, but one thing we don't really understand is where do the ultra heavy cosmic or the ultra energetic cosmic rays come from? Like what makes something that's this energetic? We don't necessarily understand it. And cosmic rays are challenging because as they travel through the universe, they get bent in magnetic fields. And so here's an example of a source. You know, if it makes photons, we can point back to it. 
uh, neutrinos also point back because they don't have charge and they don't bend in magnetic fields. But if you look at a proton, it's going to wander its way through the galaxies. There's intergalactic magnetic fields. There's galactic magnetic fields. Earth has magnetic fields. The sun has magnetic fields. And so it just gets bent off. And so it's almost impossible to point back to a source. However, because we also know that cosmic rays interact with photons, we can look for signatures that indicate that cosmic rays are being produced by sources. And so just to take you all into a little bit of particle physics, when protons interact with other photons, they can produce pions. And they can either produce neutral pions or they can produce charged pions. Now, if it produces neutral pions, those neutral pions will decay into, ga into gamma rays. And we can detect them with things like the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which I already told you about. However, if they, if they uh, produce or produce charged pions, those will uh, decay into neutrinos and other charged particles. And so this is when it would be really convenient to have a neutrino observatory because really a smoking gun for proton or hadronic acceleration is looking for neutrinos because other processes make gamma rays, not just this process. However, the way that you get neutrinos is through this process. And so what we have to do is look for neutrinos coming from extragalactic sources to try to identify what is causing these ultra high energy cosmic rays. And so there is a telescope or uh, an observatory called Ice Cube. Uh, it's located in the South Pole. And they have been taking data, you know, since the, you know, 2010 or 20, 2009 or so. And so they've built up a lot of statistics, but the probability of interacting, of neutrinos interacting is very, very low. They don't interact like photons do. And so when they built their sky map, <clears throat> you don't see a ton of hotspots coming up. And so because they have to do trials factors in looking for sources, there aren't really any sources that pop out. And once you take into account all these trials, it's all very low significance. And so the way that they really can look for sources is to not just blindly look at the whole sky and say, does anything pop out? But what they can do is use multi-wavelength data to seed their searches so that they could cut out points that they don't think have, that they don't think would make neutrinos and really zero in on targets that would. Now, of course, um, there are lots of options uh, because like I said, you're looking for places that are creating protons and cosmic rays at high energies. So one is uh, looking at these active galaxies or blazars, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. Um, there's also star forming regions. And, uh, you know, we look to try to see if there was a correlation between star forming regions and neutrinos. And then they also looked at gamma ray bursts uh, to see if there was a correlation between bursts and neutrinos. And all of these sources did not seem to be the source of the majority of these ultra high energy cosmic rays. And so, like I mentioned, we know that there are sources that produce high energy photons. And one of these photons, which is the most persistent extragalactic source in gamma rays, are active galaxies. And so active galaxies occur when you have uh, the supermassive black hole at the center actively accreting material. So material heats up and, and it starts um, collapsing in on the black hole, and then particles get shot up along the polar axes. So these jets of particles are composed of, of lots of high energy particles, and they interact with things as they go on into the universe. And now Fermi observes over 2,000 of these blazars, and as you could see, they're not only static, but they're variable. And so sometimes the conditions of the jet change, and when that happens, what you see are flares. And so this is part of that gamma ray transient sky that I was talking about that you didn't see necessarily in the map. So Ice Cube started sending out alerts 
in 2016, whenever they would observe one of these very high energy neutrinos. And so at the same time, we were looking at lat data to see if there was any correlation between these ultra high energy cosmic rays and a flaring blazar. So not just a steady state source, but an actual some conditions in the jet changed. Now, also in 2017, we found this correlation. So for the first time, we found an ultra high energy neutrino coming from this region where a blazar was flaring. And so this was fairly exciting times. Like I said, 2017 was a really big year for multi-messenger astrophysics. And so the neutrino that IceCube found, it's, it's uh, shown here. And so the way that IceCube is, is like I said, it's at the South Pole, but it's actually within the ice. And so the ice, there are these little uh, digital optical monitors, which are along strings below the ice and the ice is the interacting medium. And so a neutrino interacts with the ice and that forms a Shrankoff light. And that light is detected by these um, optical monitors. And this is what was detected by ice cube. And so you could see this is a very, very high energy event, uh, 290 TeV. So orders of magnitude higher energy than, than the subsequent gamma rays that were observed with it. And the source that this came from was called TXS 0506 plus 056. And for those of you who have really keen eye, you can see it's in the uh, Orion um, constellation. And this is what it looks like in optical. This is what it looks like in gamma rays. And this is pre-flare. And then pretty soon it'll transition. And this is post-flare. And so you can see, as far as gamma rays goes, this isn't a super dense region where you find a lot of sources. And so this really was exciting because not a lot of other things could have caused or caused that neutrino to happen. Now this particular blazar is about 4 billion light years away and it's among the 50 brightest blazars that we observe. But the interesting thing about this is that this was the first flare recorded for this particular blazar during the mission lifetime of Fermi. And so it's a very intriguing source. And so actually we had folks put together um, a raindrop animation. And so what you'll see is each of these um, circles represents a photon that was observed by the lat. And the size and color of the circle is correlated to uh, the energy of that photon. And so you can see there's lots of photons that are observed by the lot. So this is, like I said, it was a bright source. It was well-established. And that was during normal times. And then now you'll see what happens when the neutrino starts going off. And you'll see the source just starts going crazy. So tons and tons and tons of photons. So this is what was happening when the neutrino arrived. So clearly something different was happening with the source. Now, just like before, uh, Fermi or uh, Ice Cube sent around an alert to the community that this had happened. And so all the telescopes started observing it. Uh, SWIFT in particular, uh, it has an X ray telescope, a UV optical telescope, and a gamma ray telescope. And so it took the Ice Cube error region and started tiling over the whole region. And all of those X's that you see are different known X ray sources. And but SWIFT alone couldn't identify which was the source. So then Fermi, if you look, this is the Fermi data, and you can see that it was fairly low flux up until about April of that year of 2017. And so something, like I said, fundamentally was changing with the jet. And that was what was the time period when the neutrino was emitted. And so when Fermi observed this, uh, it alerted the rest of the community and this caused a MAGIC, which is a very high energy gamma ray detector that's on the ground, to start observing this. And it had never been detected by the gamma ray telescopes on the ground before. But during this period, MAGIC was able to observe it. And it got um, an indication that it was accelerating particles 
to cause gamma rays at the very, very highest energies. And so this is very exciting that there was this confirmation. And so when you're looking at the left, you see this is the error region from ice cube in red and in gray, the, the two different confidence regions. And the Fermi source is right in the middle. And so this is very unambiguous. And similarly with the magic telescopes, again, all of these were just right in the middle of this ice cube error region, which gave us confident, confidence that they were coming from the same source. Now, of course, we didn't only observe it in uh, gamma rays. Uh, like I said, we also observed it in x-rays and UV optical and radio uh, to try to understand the full picture of what was going on in particular with the source. Um, and so when you look at the, the full uh, spectral energy distribution, what you see is that all blazers have this kind of bimodal distribution because different processes are accelerating um, or, or, or producing photons at different wavelengths. And what you see is that the lower energies, so like in the radio, um, nothing seemed to be changing. So the archival data and the new data matched fairly closely. And so, okay, that is not causing these ultra high energy cosmic rays to be formed. But when you look at the second, the higher energy bump, what you see is from the archival data in gray that you know the flux went up by almost an order of magnitude. And so this was very exciting to try to you know, figure out and understand exactly what was going on with the source. And so then there's the question, you know, is this leptonic uh, acceleration, hadronic uh, acceleration, you know, what particles are being accelerated in these particle jets? Is it both? And so we need these uh, multi-wavelength, so X-rays, which really are at the saddle of that turnover in order to try to understand, uh, you know, what is the composition of these particle jets that is, is that we're observing. And so there's lots of different um, uh, papers that have proposed what exactly was going on in these jets. And what we need is just additional data in the non-flaring states. And of course, additional blazars to, to try to understand this. Now, the other cool thing that IceCube was able to do is like I said, they, they can't find sources uh, by themselves. But since this source, this TXSO506, seems to be a neutrino producer, it's possible that in the past, if you just look at that position in the sky, there could be other neutrinos that Ice Cube had missed or not reported. And so what they found was actually what they call a neutrino flare, which was 13 events, um, which is about three and a half sigma above the background of atmospheric neutrinos. And so these two things together make it very interesting. This particular source is very interesting. And since then, lots and lots of people have been following it up to try to understand what's going on with this blazar. And this just shows you, um, you know, the confidence, uh, the, the confidence region of, of looking um, back at the ice cube data and where it's localized to. And so again, you know, what processes, where exactly are the gamma rays emitted? Where are the neutrinos emitted? Is there some emission region? How far away from it is the supermassive black hole? Where do things get accelerated? All these are questions that like, we're still actively trying to figure out and understand. And it's very intriguing as to, you know, what, where this is going to go into the future. And so also excitingly in 2019, there was another potential neutrino source, again, coming from supermassive black holes in the galaxy. Uh, this um, uh, AT 2019 DSG uh, was discovered with in the same error region of another ice cube neutrino that is ice cube 191001A. And this was a part of the uh, ZTF facility. And so there's, you know, a reasonable chance coincidence that this just happened. Um, there's no obvious Fermi source within these kind of error regions. And so this is also very intriguing because it seems like, you know, maybe the gamma rays weren't produced at the same time as this kind of a neutrino. And so, of course, there was follow up again uh, with the SWIFT uh, UV optical instrument and also with the SWIFT X-ray instrument. 
And what they found was that, you know, if either of these, if the UV was the source of that neutrino, that region would have had a temperature of about, you know, 40,000 Kelvin. And it happened about 10 to the 14th centimeters away from the source. And then the X-ray would have happened at a lot higher temperatures, but a lot closer into the source. And so different models and different data gives you a different indication of where exactly these would have occurred. And so, like I mentioned, either of these particle acceleration zones could have made a neutrino, either this ultraviolet photosphere or these synchrotron zones. Um, and so there's just a lot of really exciting science that we can still try to figure out uh, when it comes to understanding how supermassive black holes accelerate particles. And so I've shared a lot about, you know, how varied and interesting the electromagnetic spectrum is and how we need all of the electromagnetic spectrum in order to really understand sources across the, the universe. Um, we're getting to the point now where we are also able to do similar kind of astronomy with gravitational waves. And so looking at the full frequency uh, spectrum uh, of gravitational waves, we can get everything from, you know, Big Bang, cosmic microwave background, oh, there's a cat, and <laughs> all the way to these pulsar timing arrays, which talk, which, you know, indicate supermassive black hole binary mergers, all the way through compact binaries, which is what you get uh, with LIGO, which are these smaller events. And now we're also, you know, thinking about neutrino spectra. So observing different energies of neutrino also tells you different uh, aspects of, of the universe and going from all the way from cosmological to, you know, uh, terrestrial to supernovae uh, energies. And so this again gives us another handle on how we can actually understand, try to understand the universe. And so this is the, the multi-messenger universe is understanding not just multi-wavelength sources, but these cosmic accelerators and cosmic explosions that are the most extreme events that happen in the universe. And so, you know, we've entered into the, to the era of multi-messenger astrophysics. Um, we can say that sources of cosmic ray acceleration have been identified through neutrinos. Uh, sources of, you know, uh, ultra heavy element formation, fundamental parameters of space time uh, with gravitational waves. And what we need are these um, high energy missions to complement them. And so really the holy grail would be to kind of understand all three of these. And Fermi is a natural bridge between all of these observations. And so this is where we are today. We have Fermi flying, we have uh, air Sharankov telescopes, we have lots of survey instruments. Uh, in the future, we're gonna get uh, new uh, survey instruments, LSSTL, though now it's the Vera Rubin Observatory, so I should probably update this. Um, we're gonna have additional ground-based gamma ray observatories, but the one thing that we also really need is a future gamma ray mission. And so what we'd like to do is really target a mission that is able to observe in the peak, in its peak sensitivity, both these kind of cosmic accelerators and these cosmic explosions, because that's really what's going to usher us into the next age. And so gamma rays are a key player, and we need a new space-based gamma ray mission to complement uh, future facilities. And so that's actually one of the things that I'm also working on, uh, these future gamma ray mission concepts. Uh, one of them is called the uh, All Sky Medium Energy Gamma Ray Observatory, or AMIGO. Uh, we have a probe scale version, uh, which we submitted a request for information to the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey and are anxiously awaiting to see what comes out of that. Um, I am also the PI of a medium uh, sized explorer mission called AMIGO X which is a slightly smaller version as it sounds, um, but also targets this energy range, uh, as you can see on the left of where there are no current missions that have flown. CompTEL was the most recent and that uh, is from 20 years ago. And so if you're interested, there's a couple of links that I've included um, at the bottom here. 
And just to give you an idea of what this kind of a telescope could do, so this is what a view of the galactic plane would look like from previous instrument from the previous instrument COMTEL. And this is what we would be able to do with a next generation MEB telescope. And so we'd see, we'd go from seeing hundreds of sources to thousands of sources in this band pass. And so a little bit about our instrument. Uh, if you remember anything from the, the LAT, uh, this looks very similar. It's made up of a tracker. It has a, a low energy and a high energy cal calorimeter. Um, and those giant wings are radiator because it dissipates a lot of heat. And this is what the instrument looks like in an exploded view. And so these kind of instruments are really what's needed uh, to usher in this next era of multi-messenger astrophysics, whether it's a probe or mid-X. Um, I think it's gonna be an exciting uh, future in this new exciting era of multi-messenger astrophysics. And uh, that's all I have. So uh, thank you for listening. All right, thank you again so much, Regina. Um, and so we will go ahead and take questions now. And folks, as you recall, um, please use the Zoom function, raise hand if you would like to ask the speaker a question. And it looks like we have one question already um, from Yoni. Hi, Regina. Um, thanks for the talk, it was uh, really great. Um, for the Amigo mission concept, could you roll back just a slide or two? Yeah. Sure. Um, is it just uh, just the the low and high energy instruments and trackers? It's not. It's just for for gamma rays. It's not also combining that with some sort of like UV, IR, or optical stuff, right? Yeah, that's that's correct. That's correct. It's just the gamma rays. Um, so just to give you a sense of scale, it's about a meter by a meter is the is that yellow inner box. And so it's pretty big. So we're, we're leaving the other wavelengths to other telescopes. This is just the gammas. <laughs> so is it sort of dependent on like really quick turnaround DDT type things from Hubble or stuff like that? Or is there another sort of pair concept that might go with it? So what's what's cool about, so, so I mean, the plan for Amigo isn't that it does direct observations. It just observes the sky in like a survey mode. And because it's it, similar to Fermi sees about 20% of the sky at any given time, um, whenever it detects, say, a gamma ray burst or a flaring uh, blazar, it would alert the community within like 30 seconds or something is, is I think the latency that we're shooting for. And so then, and all of the data is going to be public. And so there's no... Um, applying necessarily to observe specific targets and anybody can analyze any part of the data that they want. But once these uh, public alerts are made, then we would you know, leave it to the rest of the community to follow up with optical telescopes on the ground, space-based, you know, if, if SWIFT is still flying, which you know, hopefully it is, but, <laughs> but a next generation SWIFT to follow it up as well. So that, that's kind of the operating mode. Does that make, is, does that answer your question? No, that was good, thank you. Great. Um, more questions from folks. All right, we have a question from Ben. Hi, Regina. Thanks Hi. for the talk. Uh, you were talking about the uh, variable blazar source. Is there any idea on what causes the variability for it to come in and out like that? No, that's an excellent question, um, and it's something that we're trying to understand. It also uh, is complicated because not all blazar flares are the same. So one blazar could flare, and its spectrum looks completely different than before, uh, than than a previous flare. And so um, the variability is quite complicated, and it has to do something with the supermassive black hole accreting something. It could be shredding apart stars. It could be actively accreting gas and dust. Uh, the jets of particles could be interacting with the medium in a different way, like if there's some new kind of medium that happened. Um, but it's, it's quite complicated. And so we don't have all the answers for that. And I know people have studied 
you know, blazars for as long as Fermi has been flying and even before that. And just trying to figure out what's happening with one blazar is fairly complicated. Mm -hmm. As a, well, as a bit of a more in-depth question, what was the time period between the, uh, the observation of the neutrino that was detected with all the other telescopes and the first observation they went back and find? What was the time period between the variability states? So the, um, the time period was, so that the, the neutrino flare happened in 2015, and then the high energy neutrino happened in 2017. So it was a couple of years. Hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. All right, more questions from folks. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. And thank you for the talk, uh, Dr. Caputo. So as someone that is used to mirrors and CCDs and optical light, um, I had a question regarding the longevity of these, uh, of these gamma ray space missions. Do the sensitivity of the detectors decline with time? What is the upper limit on their lifetime defined by? Thank you. No, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, so Fermi so far was launched in 2008 and it's still flying. It doesn't have any consumables. And so really from the instrument perspective, it's going just fine. Uh, the calorimeter does get a little bit degraded over time, um, but that's something that we've actually been able to track and calibrate out. And so it's at least it's a predictable degradation. Um, I think that, you know, barring some electronics failure, which, you know, we hope doesn't happen, uh, the instrument would be, I think, able to take data, you know, deep into the 2030s. I think it might deorbit before then. <laughs> and so that's, that's kind of like the time scale. They, they have very long um, lifespans because uh, the instruments themselves don't really degrade over time. It, it's more of an electronics issue uh, if something like that happens. Great, thank you. Sure. Well, I'm gonna jump in and ask a question. Um, sure. So obviously the, the gravitational wave stuff is, is super exciting and it seems like really early on, especially in LIGO's run, we got some particularly interesting events. Um, and so I was wondering, especially like when, you know, if, if this is indeed correct that, you know, all of this, uh, these neutron star, neutron star mergers are really important, for example, making this, this bulk of gold. Um, and the event that we saw was a little bit special in that it was nearby. Um, when should we be seeing another of these, right? Like how, how common should these sorts of events be? Oh, that's the $64,000 question, Betsy. <laughs> No, that, that's really a good question. Uh, given that we saw it um, in 2017 and to uh, agree, it was lucky because it was a little bit off axis, um, which is why it wasn't super bright. Like the Fermi was able to detect it, no problem. It was completely detectable. But if it were really on axis, it would have been very bright given how nearby it was. Um, so when is the next one? That's a good question. Um, we thought maybe in the fourth observing run of LIGO, uh, or no, in the third one, we would be able to see, to, to, to see another one, maybe, but we didn't. Um, and now, right now, uh, right now, LIGO is upgrading its detectors uh, to start their fourth observing run. And I forget exactly when that happens. In a couple months, I think, is when they're going to start taking data. And every time they turn on, they increase the sensitivity. And so that increases the probability of seeing these events again. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll see at least another one in this next observing run, which will be about a year. Um, and then as more detectors uh, come online, uh, that will also help increase the probability because you, know, you just need sensitivity. That's really where the game is. So hopefully within the next, I think, year or two, we'll, we'll, find, we'll see another one.